Well, I'm so glad that you are joining us today, this Sunday morning, this Palm Sunday morning. And I'm super excited also for you to join us next Sunday for Easter Sunday. It's crazy. It's here, Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the resurrection. And I'm just asking you uh, to take this seriously about who are you going to invite uh, to be bold and, and, and to think about who is that person, who is that one or two people that you are going to invite to watch with you online, to send them the link, or to come sit with you in person here in our Plymouth location. And so I, I'm asking us all to be bold and to help you be bold. We've got these little bold coffee packets that you can give to your neighbor. If you're watching online, you can uh, come by this Wednesday from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night, and we'll have these invites ready for you to take. But you don't even need the bold coffee to invite someone, right? All you need is to just text someone, call someone. You never know what that invite. People are searching right now. People are searching for a home church. People are searching for answers to questions that they have. And you never know what that one invitation can do and how it can change someone's life, how it can change someone's eternity. So can't wait to see you next week for Easter. But as we think about Palm Sunday, I mean, I don't know about you, but, but, but recently I've just been a little irritable. I, I, I gotta be honest with you. I, I've just been a little on edge lately over the past month. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just, you know, like the fatigue of all that we've been through over the year of just different things and trying to navigate conversations and all the tensions that we have to, to deal with. But I've just been a little on edge and sometimes practicing humility has been a little rough. Like for instance, over um, the last month, two times this happened to me. I was walking into uh, the coffee shop to get my way too expensive cup of coffee. And as I walked into the store and was about to pay for the coffee, my mask that I had on uh, was not here above the, you know, the nose, but it wasn't here. It was like right, about right there, okay, right there. And the young girl uh, behind the plexiglass says with a really bold attitude, excuse me, sir, you need to put your mask above your nose. And, you know, normally I'd be like, yeah, I get it. Okay, fine. But for some reason, it just starts, started to just boil inside me. And then I just responded. And as I was responding, I'm like, what are you doing? Bring it back. Bring it back, Travis. I'm just like, oh, yeah, like this is really helping anyways. That's what I said to the girl. And the poor girl, I mean, she's just doing her job. Or maybe she's just trying to, like, show her power that she can have right now. I don't know. But anyways, I'm wearing Mile City gear. Really needed in that moment to drink a dose of humility. Have you struggled with all that maybe in the last week or the last month where maybe you needed to have a little dose of humility? Um, If not, then maybe you need a dose of humility because uh, you're not admitting that you need a dose of humility. You know, maybe for some of you, just the idea of there was, you know, something at work that happened uh, or something that your your colleague said or maybe there was a situation that didn't go your way or there was this argument that happened with a friend or a spouse or the person sitting next to you on the couch that you're elbowing right now where it's like, man, you just needed a little dose of humility of humility. And so if that's you, you're in good company because today we're going to need to talk about a great example of what it means to have bold humility. Today is Palm Sunday and we're going to talk about the triumphal entry that we celebrate on this Sunday as Jesus was walking into Jerusalem for the last time. And whether you are a Jesus follower or not, uh, This is important for all of us because who doesn't want to have more humility in their life, right? I mean, last time I checked, we're all not wanting to sign up to go hang out with a prideful, arrogant person. Give me some more pride and arrogance around me. I mean, right? None of us want that. And so today we're going to look at some amazing tips that we see from Jesus as he walks into Jerusalem for the very last time. But before we do, I just want to pray for you and pray for me as we dive in. Father, thank you for joining us. Uh, together here online. And I just ask wherever we're watching that you would help us to tune in to what you'd have for us, that we wouldn't miss it, and uh, that we would lean into your example of what it means to have bold humility as we close out this bold series. And so, Father, control my mind, control my speech as I talk right now. And I pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Well, I want you to open up to the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew, open up or turn it on your phone. Book of Matthew, chapter 21. That's the first book of the New Testament. So pretty easy to find. And what's really interesting about this story is this story is found in all of the gospel accounts. The gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the stories telling the story of Jesus. And there's only about a dozen or so events that are actually all in all four books. And so this shows the significance of this event. It shows the harmony of this event, how they're all very identical, and just a few different details that each writer puts in to kind of bring the story to full. It's unbelievable. And so here's what the story picks up. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. It says this. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives... So here we have Jesus and his disciples walking into Jerusalem for the last time before Jesus is going to be crucified, and he knows that he's going to be crucified. Now that alone in itself is showing some serious bold humility, right? I mean, the the fact that, that he was willing to go and lay his life down for the sin of the world is bold humility in itself. But another thing that we see here that pops out is the idea is that when he was drawing near to Jerusalem, he was drawing near to people that maybe he didn't really want to deal with. He had to draw near to people that maybe were asking annoying questions all the time. He was drawing near to the Pharisees that were literally trying to trick him and were in cahoots to trap him, which gives us a really great reminder and example of having bold humility requires you and me to have the spirit of unity. Bold humility requires us to have the spirit of unity, to deal with the people that we just sometimes don't want to deal with. Those difficult people. You know who I'm talking about? You have difficult people in your life, the people that you maybe don't want to deal with. You know who they are. Maybe the people that get under your skin, the people that overreact or over petty things, the, the people that, that are always trying to one-up you or make you feel like that you're not good enough or they've wronged you in some way or betrayed you or made you feel deflated. And even the thought of thinking about those people right now is, is making you angry inside. It's making you frustrated inside. And Maybe, maybe, just maybe, God might be calling out to you today and saying, okay, well, who is that person? Who is that person that you're trying to avoid? Who is that person that you're trying to stay far away from? And maybe he's calling out to you to say, hey, have bold humility, draw near towards that person, and have a spirit of unity. Bold humility requires us the spirit of of unity. Let's keep going. Some more examples of humility in this story. It says, Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. It continues. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, which was the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9.9. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, before modern times when it came to coronations of kings and queens, I mean, it wasn't just some ordinary ordeal, man. This was a lavish, extravagant robes and crowns and jewels, pageantries. I mean, it was, you know, you would have chariots drawn by stately white stallion horses. I mean, it was just it was quite a spectacle. But what do we see here? Jesus? I mean, come on. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the inventor of it all, the creator of it all, the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills comes rolling in here on a donkey, humbling himself, the fowl of a beast, the burden, symbolically showing the burden that he was going to take on the sin of the world. He rolls in on a donkey. This is unbelievable, and it makes me step back and say and ask the question to myself, wow, if I was a king, Coming in for my coronation, how would I ride in? What would I expect? What would be my rider and my demands? What would I wear? What would I want to be driven in? Jesus gives up his deserved, massive, glorious chariot to ride in on a small, simple colt, showing us the example that bold humility requires you to lay down the spirit of entitlement. Bold humility 
requires you, requires me to lay down the spirit of entitlement. Understanding the idea that, again, he traded in his deserved comfortable chariot for an uncomfortable colt. And I'll tell you what, so what does this mean for us to have to lay down the spirit of entitlement? And, and, and this hit me right upside the head this week. That, that when I think about this, not only, what does this mean for you? What does this mean? And I hope this speaks to you today. That, is that not only am I to lay down my entitlement, my spirit of entitlement, but I'm not even worthy to ride the ass. Wait, what did he just say? Yeah, that's what I said. Not only am I to lay down the spirit of entitlement, but I'm not even worthy to ride the ass. It's in the Bible. It's in the scriptures. Look, it says it right here in the KJV. The only time I use the KJV is for moments like this. But you get my point, right? We, we live in such a world. We're Americans. If you're watching and you're in America, you're an American and we automatically assume things, that, that we deserve things. We have this spirit of entitlement. It's not really hard to find around us, and especially because we can see it in ourselves all the time. I mean, this past month, I'll never, I was in Five Guys, okay? I was in Five Guys. And, and this lady walks in there, and I watch her. She's got her phone with a timer, because she ordered online and she's looking at the timer, wondering how long they're going to be overdue on her order. And guess what? It got up to seven minutes. And she starts getting all upset and they're making her fries and then she, they're starting to bag everything up. She says, no, 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 no. These hamburgers have been sitting too long and, and I want new hamburgers now. And they're like, well, we were making you fresh, hot fries. It doesn't matter. These are now lukewarm hamburgers. And she starts yelling at these poor high schoolers back there working. You can tell they're short staffed. I mean, poor restaurant workers right now just trying to get back up on their feet. And she is just losing it on them. And so I just, I, I couldn't take it anymore. So I just, I just went up to her. I said, ma'am, I just overheard what you're saying. I am so sorry. I mean, to think that you had to wait an extra seven minutes for your hamburgers, and now they're lukewarm, and you got to get these waiting on your hot, fresh fries just for you. I don't know how you're dealing with this, and this is so terrible. Can I, let me just buy your meal for you. Can I just do that for you? And she looked at me like, you son. Just kidding. I didn't approach her. I didn't approach the woman. I, now I kind of wish that I did, but I didn't do that. But, right, the spirit of entitlement. Where, where, here, here's a question for you that I've been asking myself all week. Where is your entitlement? What, where is the spirit of entitlement getting the best of you? Is there a job now in, in, in your work life that's just too little for you because you have other people that can do that for you? Do you expect your spouse or your parents to do something for you and then when it doesn't happen, it's like, look out, look out of the way? Is the things that you have, the material possessions that you have, do you just expect that you should have those things, that you're entitled to those things, that you should have a phone, that you should have a house, that you should have a car? Or do you look at the things that you have not with entitlement but with gratefulness that you have those things? We have this great example that Jesus, when it comes to the spirit of entitlement, he passed on the chariot. And he took up and he rode a colt instead. Bold humility requires us to lay down that spirit of entitlement. Let's keep going. It says that the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. It says that they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Now Matthew and John leave out this detail that Mark and Luke give us, and that's the details when they went to go get the donkey, the donkey owners caught them untying the donkey and said, whoa, 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 what are we untying our donkeys for? Like, get away, step away from the donkey, you know? I mean, it would be the equivalent because, you know, remember, livestock, donkeys, I mean, these were valuable assets. It would be like someone going up to your car and just randomly, like, trying to get into your car and start to hotwire. You'd be like, whoa, 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 step away. And, and so what does it say? It, it says that they actually just let them do it. They actually gave them the donkey. They were open-handed and gave them the donkey. But we have to remember, we don't know if they were Jesus followers. Most likely, in my opinion, they weren't. 
But yet they were willing to be open-handed and generous, showing us the example that bold humility requires you the spirit of generosity. To have bold humility, it requires us to have the spirit of generosity. To not hold on to the stuff that we have too tightly. Again, it's not wrong to have nice things. It's not wrong to have stuff. It's not wrong to own stuff. The problem is is when the stuff owns you. The problem is is when the stuff owns me. I mean, Jen and I talk about this all the time when, we, when it comes to our, our stuff. Are, are, are we willing to be open-handed with all of our stuff? At any given point, if God told us to downsize our house, to sell one of our investments, to, to get rid of one of our cars to help build his kingdom, are we willing to do that? Are, are we open-handed? Are, are we willing to humble ourselves and be bold with our generosity? Because there's this idea, right, that we have to remember that's so true that all that we have is from God. And we're supposed to give our first fruits of what comes to us back to God. Proverbs 3, 9 tells us this, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. We're supposed to give the first fruits, the tithe, back to God what is rightfully his. We don't want to cheat God. We don't want to rob God what is his. Now, is that me saying to you right now that, uh, that I want you to give financially to Mile City Church? Well, yeah, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. But not for Mile City's sake, not for Travis's sake, but for your sake. Because when you get to the point to give a portion of what God has given to you back to him, what is rightfully his, and you actually lay down that and surrender and trust him with every area of your life, including your finances, there is freedom in that, and he calls us to do that, to be obedient to that. And whether that's Miles City or not, my hope and challenge for all of us is that we are giving generously to help build his kingdom through the local church. And if that's not Mile City, then you need to find a church that you're proud of, that you believe in, that you see making a kingdom impact, and we need to invest in it, giving God the first fruits of all that he has given us. I mean, for example, many um, that are watching, you've gotten the stimulus check. Now, where did the stimulus check come from? Did your stimulus checks come from Biden? Did they come from Trump? Okay, maybe, kind of. But everything thinking 30,000 foot, no, no, no. All, every good and perfect gift comes from God above, from our Father above. And so even with that, to give our first fruits. And for some of you, that stimulus check was to finally pay the mortgage that you were behind on, to pay the rent that you were behind on, to actually put a meal on the table for your family. You desperately needed that. But it's still taking every good and perfect gift that we have, and we give God a portion of the extra that has come our way. For some of you, the stimulus check meant not a meal or paying your mortgage. It meant getting a new pair of shoes. It, it meant getting a new gadget that you've been always wanting, which is fine, or getting an, 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 you know, a new car part or whatever it is, which is fine. But it's also reminding ourselves, well, are we still giving a portion? Maybe that's God calling us to give a half. Maybe that's God saying, give it all, because I didn't really need it in the first place. It's God is going to call us all to different things and how we're going to be generous. And the real question is, is, is the main point is, are we holding on to it too tightly? Are we being open-handed? It takes bold humility to have bold generosity. Where might God be calling you to be more bold in your generosity? Let's continue. It says this. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It says that they spread their cloaks on the road. It was in that culture uh, when they would, a, a sign of kingship where they would take their, their, their garments and they would lay them before the king as the king would come and they would trample on the garments showing submission and reverence and trust. The symbol of the palm branches would, would, would be a symbol of salvation and joy laying down before the king that would come that you offer salvation, that you offer us joy. And so, there's King Jesus rolling in into Jerusalem on a donkey, trampling on the palm branches, trampling on the garments. And it got me thinking. I wonder in that moment 
if Jesus was just taken in that praise. If like in that moment, was he just enjoying that moment? Or because he was God in the flesh, was he thinking of the future and, and understanding that the garments that he was trampling on, the hearts that put those garments and palm branches down, would soon be the same people that would quickly turn their backs on him and trample on him and cry out for him to be crucified? Was that what was going on in his mind? Because you see, people were laying their garments down. They were laying palm branches down in surrender to him, but it was on their terms. Because you see, they wanted Jesus to come in and conquer Rome. But Jesus didn't come in to conquer Rome. He came to conquer sin. They wanted Jesus to come in and take the crown of gold and jewels. But he came in Jerusalem to take the crown of thorns. They wanted him to come in with the sword, but he instead just took the sword. Showing us, giving us the example, is that sometimes bold humility requires you to be trampled on when necessary. Let me say that again. Bold humility sometimes requires us to be trampled on when necessary. Now, hear me clearly. If you are being physically abused, if you are being sexually abused, you need to sound the alarm and you need to get help right away. But sometimes there are instances relationally and emotionally where we have to take a 30,000 foot view and just take it to be trampled on when necessary, to just take it. Like, for instance, when a coworker, um, you know, drops the ball and leaves you to pick up the slack, sometimes, when necessary, you just need to take it. Or maybe sometimes uh, there's a disagreement with someone and you're feuding back and forth and you're trying to find, but it's not going to go well and the disagreement keeps happening and happening and you're arguing and arguing and then they take your reputation and then they smear it in the ground and they trample on your reputation in person or online all over the place. Sometimes when necessary, that means that we just need to take it. Sometimes people are going to make fun of your belief system and bully you potentially for your belief system. Sometimes that means that we're just supposed to take it. Sometimes your spouse is going to have a rough day and they're going to come home and they're going to take it out on you. And sometimes we just need to let them vent and we just need to take it. Sometimes people might give you the cold shoulder and make you feel left out and you feel a little deflated by that. Sometimes when necessary, we're just supposed to take it. To take a deep breath, to take a step back, to have a 30,000 foot view and be like, is this truly worth fighting for. I had an old pastor tell me years ago, Travis, stay out of the weeds. Stay out of the weeds. You need to stay up in the clouds and stay out of the weeds and pick those battles because you don't want to be running around chasing snakes all the time. You got to think of the bigger, bigger picture. So bold humility requires us to be trampled on when necessary. And sometimes, right, it just feels like, you know, earthly that, man, we're just getting buried. We're just getting tumbled on. But really, eternally and spiritually, God is actually lifting us up because he exalts the humble and he opposes the proud. Matthew 23, later, Jesus would tell us this. He says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So, let's recap. Bold humility, what does it require us? What does it require us? It requires us to have the spirit of unity. Is there someone in your life that God might be calling you to stop avoiding that you need to draw near and fight for the spirit of unity? Bold humility requires us to lay down the spirit of entitlement. Where is an area of your life that you need to lay down your entitlement? To have the spirit of generosity, where might God be pushing you to be bold in your humility, to have more bold generosity? And then to be trampled on when necessary. Where is an area of your life that maybe right now you might just need to take, that you just need to take it? So, the triumphal entry. When you think about it, 
it's uh, not so triumphant for him, is it? It's not so triumphant for Jesus. But then when you really think about it, yeah, it's not so triumphant for him, but man, it is so triumphant for us. And aren't you glad that Jesus took it? Aren't you glad that he allowed himself to be trampled on for you and for me? That he was willing to die for us with such great love, to conquer death, to conquer our sin problem once and for all and then rose from the dead? It's unbelievable that he, with such bold humility, walked into Jerusalem one last time for you and for me. He entered into Jerusalem for you. Have you allowed Jesus to enter now into your life? Have you allowed that triumphal experience to actually engage into your life? Or are you like maybe some of those in the crowd that maybe have just laid down garments or have kind of uh, falsely surrendered to him because it's based on your terms? Maybe if you're honest, you haven't fully surrendered to him. You falsely surrendered saying to him, well, I'll I'll surrender to you, but you got to do A, B, and C, and then maybe. That's not a full surrendered life. You see, his terms, he's made pretty simple, though. Can't be on your terms, it's on his terms. And guess what his terms are? You got to trust me, and you got to follow me. Trust me. Follow me. Have you done that? Have you truly laid down your life to Jesus to trust him to be your savior, to save you from yourself and to follow after him for the rest of your life? If you haven't, if you know it's just been kind of on your terms, we'll see what happens and you're done with that and you wanna make it real, I wanna give you the opportunity right now. So wherever you're watching, just be real before God and just say, Father, Here I am. I give you my life on your terms. I trust you. I want to follow you. I confess my sins to you. I believe that you, Jesus, are alone, are God. Thank you. And I just thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising again for me. Right now, I lower my pride and I surrender my life to you. I receive you, Jesus. Enter into my life right now as we continue to pray, if you truly meant that, if you truly laid down your life and gave Jesus your life, the scriptures say that you are saved. You'll no longer perish, but have everlasting life. Father, thank you for giving us the model of humility. Help us to model that. Help us to be alert to the areas that we need to show humility Again, thank you for the model. Thank you for the example of what you've done for us. We pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you made that decision, if you had bold humility today and surrendered your life to Jesus for the first time, we want to celebrate with you. We want to answer any questions that you may have. We're just a bunch of imperfect people. We don't have all the answers, but, but we would just love to talk with you to celebrate this move, this decision that you've made. And so you can just text the word Mile City to 94,000 and we would love to celebrate with you the decision that you have made. So right now, um, before you go off, before you do your next thing with your day, I I just really want to encourage you. It's so important to process what God may have spoken to us and to do something about it, to put it into action this week. And so the band's going to play a song and as they play the song, let's Let's keep looking at areas in our lives that we've gone through where maybe we need to have some more bold humility. Look at these different areas, process this, these, these different areas, and ask God, okay, how do I need to respond specifically today? And so as this song is played, let's continually move towards God together.
beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus you didn't want heaven without us so jesus you Nothing comes.